They didn't invite them. Why not? Yeah, okay, maybe they forgot, but... Yeah, I don't know. They lost a lot of men clearing it. Yeah, that's just bad style. Yeah, I agree. December 2nd, 1944. The Red Army has taken a great deal of territory from the Axis this year, first liberating its own former territory and then marching on, defeating Axis power after power until only the Germans and Hungarians are left. And now, they're making plans for their big 1945 invasion. How big, you may ask? Six million men big. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Allied attacks in the West took Metz and Strasbourg, though further north on the front, it was hard going. The Japanese took Dushan and Nanning in China, the fight for Peleliu came to its end, and the Soviets advanced on the Danube. This week on the 27th, Georgi Zhukov arrives at Stavka to discuss operations and plans for the upcoming Soviet January offensive to hopefully reach Berlin. Front assignments are being specified this month. The first General Staff Plan has Zhukov's 1st Belarusian Front attacking from the Magnushev and Pulavi bridgeheads on the Vistula. They will try to break through the defenses as quickly as possible. For that, though, they'll need help from the flanks drawing off force, as I've talked about before. Ivan Konyev's 1st Ukrainian Front on Zhukov's left should not attack directly in the shortest path to Germany, but aim a bit north towards Kalish. This to avoid crashing into Upper Silesia, since that industrial region is just tailor-made for defense. German Silesia is also a tough obstacle, so the general staff plan is to outflank them from the north and northeast, which would not only bring Konyev's armies into the German rear around Poznan, but would save the Silesian factories from destruction. Zhukov wants to now change the plan a little bit and have his front attack first towards Woj and then Poznan. Stalin says okay, but that changes Konyev's initial target from Kalish to Breslau. The basic plan is still the same though. Though formal Stavka directives had not yet been issued, the normal pre-offensive preparations went ahead with a significant buildup in reserves and the stockpiling of supplies. Even the simplest military tally suggested the scale of the storm about to break over the Eastern Front. Soviet strength in the field climbed to over six and a half million men, supported by more than 100,000 guns and mortars, 13,000 tanks and self-propelled guns, over 15,000 aircraft, 55 all-arms armies, six tank armies, and 13 air armies, no less than 500 rifle divisions being prepared for the final apocalyptic battle. The Soviets are still fighting in the field now, of course. Units from Fyodor Tolbukhin's 3rd Ukrainian Front take Mohach the 28th and advance on Pitch, taking it the following day, with the assistance of a miners' uprising. The Germans haven't decided where to defend against Tolbukhin's forces because they're not sure where he's headed. Army Group South Commander Johannes Friesner thinks he's going to make a two-pronged attack, with the left aiming for the oil field southwest of Lake Balaton, and the right going past the lake and around Budapest to the west. Army Group F Commander Maximilian von Weichs thinks this is possible, but when deciding where to send his second panzer army, figures the Soviets will actually go west towards Zagreb to cut the main German communication lines with the Balkans so he would allow 2nd Panzer to pull back west of the Drava. This, of course, would mean that Army Group South would have to defend the area between Lake Balaton and the river with something else. So Friesner wants 2nd Panzer to remain east and north of the river. Well, on the 1st, Tolbukhin's forces renew the attack, and 57th Army moves from Pech to Kaposvar and 4th Guards north along the Danube. Two prongs. Adolf Hitler then assigned 2nd Panzer Army to Army Group South. Today, Friesner orders 2nd Panzer to break contact with Army Group F and take and hold positions between the southern tip of the lake and the Drava southwest of Najkanitsa. Tolbukhin's northward thrust forced Army Group South into a round of unit shuffling that was nearly as wearing on troops and equipment as combat and that could quickly have proved fatal had the Russians themselves not been far below top form. 
Hungarian Second Army had practically vanished. To close the ensuing gap between Lake Balaton and the Danube, Freter Pico was having to put in German divisions from the Budapest Hatvan area. That last includes taking a division from Mischkoltz, weakening the town at just the wrong time because Rodion Malinowski's second Ukrainian front begins a new Hungarian offensive north of Debrecen, attacking Mischkoltz the second. But let's take a look at Budapest for a minute, the big prize. Friesner was trying to talk Hitler and Guderian out of trying to defend Budapest in a house-to-house -house battle. He resolved, if he could not hold the enemy on the edge of the city, to go behind the Danube and blow the bridges. The army group did not have the strength, he said, to fight the Russians and simultaneously suppress the big city mob. Hitler was unconvinced. Still, he did not issue a definite order for a house-to-house -house defense until the 26th of November. As of that date, the army group had not constructed any positions inside the city for fear of inciting the people. December the 1st, Hitler issues orders declaring Budapest a fortress city, meaning that the troops in the city must fight and fight to the last round to hold it. That's a prize the Allies might take in the future, but they finally get to use one they took a while ago this week. A stately procession of 19 cargo ships glided up the Grey Scheldt in a pelting rain on Tuesday morning, November 28th. Seamen and anxious war correspondents crowded the rails, squinting for mines. Photographers and dignitaries crowded the wharfs, including Belgian worthies and legates from 21st Army Group. Yeah, well, they sort of forgot to invite the Canadians, which is pretty crappy when you consider that the Canadians took like 13,000 casualties in the Battle of the Scheldt. But what all of this is celebrating is that the port of Antwerp is now open to the Allies. It's taken 200 minesweepers in 15 little armadas going up and down the 120 kilometers 17 times the past three weeks, but it is done. There is still a problem with transport for stuff once it arrives at the port, but this is a huge deal for the Allies. And the forces that they will be supplying are fighting heavily this week. On the 26th, the battle for Hurtgen is renewed by the 121st Infantry Regiment from U.S. 8th Division. With all the slogging fighting in the forest last week, this might not sound so promising, but they have actually managed to knock the enemy from the most defensible forest defense lines. So when they go into action, the Germans have withdrawn and they soon overlook Hurtgen village from west and southwest. The enemy has not, however, withdrawn from the village and it is tough fighting until the afternoon of the 28th before it is finally in Allied hands after two months of troubles. The next objective is Kleinhau, which they take the next day. They now have control of a fair amount of the only good road network between Hurtgen Forest and the Ruhr River, and at least a starting point for taking the Brandenburg-Bergstein Ridge, the highest one, the capture of which would enable 5th Corps to reach the Ruhr and finally provide the flank support for 7th Corps' main drive. This is obviously the next target here, though after regrouping, the main effort along the Brandenburg Road doesn't begin until today, when a minefield stops the advance as soon as it starts. As for Ray Barton's 4th Division attacks, which renew the 29th towards Grosshau and Duren, in the kind of slugging match that the Siegfried Line campaign had become, little opportunity existed, once all units were committed, for division commanders to influence the battle in any grand, decisive manner. That was the situation General Barton had faced throughout much of the Hurtgen Forest fighting. But as of the 28th of November, matters were somewhat different. Having narrowed his regimental zones of action, Barton had managed for the first time to achieve a compact formation within a zone of reasonable width. Unfortunately, General Barton could not ignore another factor. By this time, his three regiments were, in effect, masqueraders operating under the assumed names of the three veteran regiments which had come into the forest in early November. This is pretty accurate. Many squad leaders by now were privates because of all the casualties and replacements. The staff sergeants, who usually command the squads, have platoons. The few officers still running platoons are mostly now replacements from things like, like heavy weapons units. Some companies have gone through three or even four commanders by now. 
Still, they take Grosshau the 29th, and 4th Division sets its full sights on Duren. By the end of the day, December 1st, units are all the way through Hurtgen Forest. But that night, Barton talks to 7th Corps Commander Joe Collins about 4th Division's dire state. Collins orders 4th Division to halt its attacks. And as for the 1st Division advance on Langerwehe, stymied by Hill 203 last week, renewed attempts this week finally take the hill to 27th, and Langerwehe, gateway to the Ruhr Plain, is next. It falls by nightfall the 28th. Other units, though, have still not managed to take Merude to the southeast, and the Germans still hold it by week's end, having inflicted heavy casualties on all attackers. Today, Collins asks 1st Division to just straighten the line and wait for relief. 5th Division will arrive the 5th. In the past 15 days, 1st Division and 47th Infantry, with some armored help, have advanced 6.5 kilometers to Langerwehe. They have cleared 28 square kilometers, 11 square miles, of the northeast tip of Hurtgen Forest. This does not sound like much. However, this is pretty much the end of the Battle of Hurtgen Forest, where at least one unit has been fighting continuously since September 14th. And for the 30,000 casualties, was it worth it? Well, it's hard to see an alternative. I mean, if they had bypassed it, Courtney Hodges would have First Army with zero reserves with a completely exposed flank. And in the fight, they have savaged many German divisions. But Charles MacDonald has this to add. They had also forced the Germans to commit some of the forces intended to be held intact for the Ardennes counteroffensive. Beyond these, the fight in the forest had achieved little in the way of positive advantages. The basic truth was that the fight for Hurtgen Forest was predicated on the purely negative reason of denying the Germans the use of the forest as a base for thwarting an American drive to the Rhine. In the process, the fight thus far had failed to carry the only really critical objective the forest shielded, the Ruhr River dams. They are trying to reach the Ruhr elsewhere, though. But after the Allied advances towards the Inder River Valley last week, the Germans managed to now slow down 104th Division. In fact, Inden, the last of the three Inde Valley villages to haul, holds out until the 30th when the Germans pull back to the east bank of the river. 104th still has orders to proceed to the Ruhr River, and they need to cross the Inde to keep up with the rest of 7th Corps' main thrust on their right, even though it's been checked at Langerwehe and Merode. They begin crossing just before midnight, tonight. Ray McLean's 19th Corps' renewed drive to the Ruhr gets going the 28th, reaching the river in force that day. Alvin Gillum's 13th Corps begins its push to the river the 29th. On the 1st, 102nd Division reaches Linish. As for down at the other end of the front in France, after all the fighting and advances and controversy last week down there, there is not that much to report this week as 3rd and 7th Army advances are very slow. George Patton's 3rd Army does take more crossings of the Saar today on the 2nd, though. As for Allied operations in Italy, British 5th Corps Commander Charles Cately's plans for the next 8th Army offensive are as follows. Canadian 1st Corps is to advance on Russi and cut the Via Adriatica northwest of Ravenna, and then cross the Santerno. British 5th Corps is to advance along the Via Emilia and set up bridgeheads on the Lamone, Senio, and Santerno River. Polish 2nd Corps protects the left flank of the offensive threatening Imola, and British 13th Corps, the right wing of U.S. 5th Army, will also advance along the Senio and Santerno valleys. Once it gets going, the terrain will likely cause a few changes to the overall plans. But get going it does this evening as the week ends, and we will see some success or failure next week. I'd like to look briefly at a part of Europe that has only recently been freed of Axis occupation, Greece. There's turmoil developing there just now. Okay, on November 30th, Giorgio Santos, Secretary General of the Communist Party, KKE, reinstates the Central Committee of ELAS. ELAS is the military arm of the National Liberation Front, EAM. Thing is, this violates the Caserta Agreement, which put the partisan forces under the leadership of the Greek government, and then all under British General Ronald Scobie. So on December 1st, Scobie issues an order disarming all partisans, effective by December 10th. 
Reacting to that, all EAM members currently holding government posts resign, and the Athenian EALAS is activated and put on alert. Today, EAM calls for a mass demonstration in front of the palace tomorrow, and a general strike to begin the 4th. The situation there is quite delicate. Now, whatever happens there in the future, if you want to get some more background on the situation that's happening there now, you can check out the War Against Humanity series with Spartacus Olson. He's been talking a bit about that for quite some time. Another situation that is quite delicate, to say the least, is the aerial situation in the Philippines for the Allies. Now, George Kenney is in charge of the Allied Air Forces in the Southwest Pacific area. And neither he nor Area Commander Douglas MacArthur expected heavy action on land or in the skies on Leyte, thinking the Japanese would be conserving force to fight on Luzon, or Formosa, or the home islands. Kenny had no idea of the extent of effectiveness of the Japanese air reinforcement system for the Philippines. Even in the wake of the Leyte Sea battles, planes had been moving from Kyushu to Formosa to the 70 or so airfields and airstrips on Luzon, and from the East Indies and Borneo to Cebu and Negros in the Visayas, providing significant threats from north and west to Leyte and vessels navigating among the islands. There is also the new menace of kamikazes to deal with since last month when Japanese command, especially Takajiro Onishi, figured only the most extreme measures possible could stop the U.S. Navy. This also really showcases the extreme lengths the Japanese will go to to defend their empire. But no one can deny the results. For the loss of a plane and a pilot, usually a student pilot without much experience, you can do an awful lot of damage. So, all November, the Japanese have been feeding planes and pilots to their doom, and by now, tempers are flaring in American command. See, Tom Kincaid has under 100 planes on his escort carriers, so he depends on either Bull Halsey or Kenny to really protect the rest of his fleet. But twice this week, kamikazes damage his battleships and destroyers in Leyte Gulf, killing a lot of people. Kincaid blames Kenny for this, but whoever blames whomever, the plain fact is that MacArthur won't be able to hit Luzon until Japan's land-based air power is overcome. And as we've seen, it's going to take time for the Army Air Force to be ready on Leyte. But wait. What about Halsey's fast carrier fleet, you ask? Well, sure. It's been doing a lot of damage to the Japanese, but the ships have to rest and refit at some point, and three fleet carriers and two light carriers have taken serious damage from kamikazes. So Halsey is down to 12 fast carriers, and he has the new mantra, only strikes in great force for valuable stakes or at vital times would justify exposure of the fast carriers to suicidal attacks. One would think that would include the invasion of Luzon, but that starts with a preliminary invasion of Mindoro, southwest of Luzon. It's a great stepping stone. However, who is going to protect the attack and the supply convoys? For MacArthur, it can only be the fast carrier fleet. But for Pacific Fleet Commander Chester Nimitz, the Japanese choosing to fight for Leyte is both a problem and an opportunity. An opportunity because it does give the Americans a chance to seriously reduce enemy plane numbers, albeit at a cost in ships. Attacks on the Japanese Air Force at Luzon would have to continue, either until MacArthur's land-based Air Force was fully in action or the enemy weekend. So, a Luzon air battle was not only necessary, but advantageous, in that the Japanese were concentrating their air power in a position where it was open to destruction. Nimitz made clear his conditions. The carrier fleet absolutely required rest, repair, and replenishment at Ulithi. MacArthur had suggested placement of the fleet west of Luzon. Nimitz responded that the fleet would stay east of Luzon. A question therefore arose regarding protection of the Luzon landing. There has been a fair bit of discussion about postponing the Luzon landings. And though MacArthur wants to stick to the timetable, all of his commanders want to postpone. Back on November 17th, Nimitz said straight out that the carriers are not going to be responsible for covering both Mindoro and Luzon 
without real replenishment at Ulithi before and then also between the landings, 10 days to two weeks. He gets no answer. So this week on the 29th, he repeats the offer. He is on the postponed side as well, by the way. I mean, the carrier fleet has been at sea for 84 days and the land-based planes are only slowly starting to build up force on Leyte. Wouldn't it be great if they could both support the landings, ensuring aerial supremacy. He's giving MacArthur what he wants too, support for both landings. So on the 30th, MacArthur postpones Mindoro from 5th to 15th of December and Luzon from the 20th to January 9th. This will also affect planned invasions of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. There's an immediate positive effect of this too. Remember the other week that 77th Division was diverted to go and join the fight for Leyte? Well, that frees up landing ships for them to plan an amphibious landing at Ormoc once they get to Eastern Leyte, which will be in just a few days. And also in naval action in that part of the world, on the 29th off Honshu, US sub Archerfish sinks Japanese carrier Shinano. Shinano was actually first built to be a sister ship to the giant battleships Yamato and Musashi, but after the Battle of Midway was converted into a carrier. Not a fleet carrier, but a support carrier for other carriers. She is sunk by four torpedoes and is the largest warship ever sunk by a submarine. And we come to the end of another week of the war. With the Allies advancing to the Ruhr, clearing Hurtgen Forest, and finally being able to use the port of Antwerp. Big problems with air power in the Philippines, the Soviets advancing around Hungary, but the Axis determined to hold Budapest and Soviet plans for 1945. Can you believe it's December 1944 already? And things just keep changing. I mean, after the past few months, Japan still has a ton of territory on the map, but not a whole lot of Navy to keep it secure. Though how much Navy do they need in China? The fight in Europe has been brought within German borders the past couple months, but the Germans are still not only holding their enemies generally at bay the past few weeks, but are planning a counteroffensive even. Every few months, it seems somehow that it's almost over, but it's not almost over. No one plans on surrendering, no matter how many men will die otherwise. So, make no mistake, those men will die. Many, many tens of thousands of men will die before this is finally over. But however long that takes, I will be here to cover it all week by week by week. And I can do that thanks to the Time Ghost Army, for that is what finances our productions. You too can join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are the newest commissioned army officers, and the army member of the week is Fernando Lopez Ojeda. Hey, if you want to see how Japan built its navy up in the first place and the competing Japanese naval doctrines, check out our mini-series Pearl Harbor Minute by Minute right here. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.